welcome you all to the course of evolution of electrical energy the world of electrical energy is enlightening electricity removes the darkness around us it launches our mornings and makes our life comfortable electricity powers our days the field of electrical energy serves huge number of applications from tiny motors to giant floats it revolutionizes transportation it controls the whole world and what not in this course we are going to discuss about the evolution of electrical energy the concepts of the evolution of electrical energy will be discussed and the applications will be taken over there are variety of applications where this electrical energy plays a role before going into applications let me see what is this electrical energy where it is produced which concept it is evolved when you take this electrical energy this energy is the energy derived from electrical charges it starts its journey from generating stations it travels and distributes to variety of applications let me see from where this electrical energy starts its journey the basic fundamentals of this electrical energy is evolved from physics in physics magnetism charges plays a role in electricity faraday's law of electromagnetic induction this is taken to be the basic law from which electricity is generated according to faraday's law of electromagnetic induction whenever the flux linking a conductor changes a voltage is induced in the conductor to the magnetic field and this rotator so the flux that is linking the conductor changes and what happens here is an emf is induced in the conductor so that induction of emf is visualized in the galvanometer generators this generators use the principle of faraday's law of electromagnetic induction in the previous slide we have seen how voltage is generated in a coil so here in generators huge coils are present inside the machine to generate electricity so the picture shows a generator which is used in generating station this is where electricity is produced what are these power generating stations these power generating stations are the places where the electrical power is generated there are many power generating stations to name a few are thermal power station where coal is used as the fuel hydroelectric power station where water is used used as the resource nuclear power station where thermal fission and fusion reaction is used as the source tidal power station where the tidal energy is used to generate electricity geothermal power station where the heat energy from the earth is used to generate electricity and gener electricity is also generated from renewable energy sources there are many other sources available for generation of electricity you will be interested before going into power generating stations let me understand how electricity is generated the fundamental concept behind a power generating station so here you can see a generator is connected to a turbine and the input from the source is fed through the steam the steam is produced from the different forms of sources maybe coal or a nuclear power nuclear fission and fusion reaction so some form of uh, input is fed to the turbine which rotates the turbine this turbine rotation is in turn connected to the conductors of the generator so when turbine rotates the conductors also rotates when the conductor rotates the flux linking the conductor changes when the flux linking the conductor changes as learnt earlier according to faraday's law of electromagnetic induction whenever the flux linking a conductor changes a voltage is induced in the conductor so a voltage will be induced in the generator in the conductors of the generator this voltage will be taken out and fed to the transmission and distribution line and it reaches our home let me have an insight of different types of power generating stations the thermal power station shares a huge portion of power production in the country the coal is the source of fuel in thermal power plant the coal is burnt which generates heat and produces steam 
The steam runs the steam turbine which is connected to the giant generators. The generators, also called alternators, produce electrical power. Hydroelectric power plant is the second largest power generating station in the country. Hydro power plants are also called as renewable power plants. In hydroelectric power plants, the moving water runs the turbine and the turbine in turn rotates the generator by which the electricity is produced in the generator. The nuclear power plants work similar to that of thermal power plants in which the steam is produced by means of nuclear fission and fusion reaction and the steam rotates the turbine. The turbine in turn is connected to the generator and the generator generates electricity. The other forms of energy through which electricity is generated are renewable energy sources. The renewable energy sources are named so because they are always available non-depletable in nature. The forms of renewable energy sources are solar, hydro, geothermal, biomass and wind. Wind energy conversion systems are which in which the wind energy is used to generate electricity. The wind power rotates the huge blades present in, present in the wind turbine. The wind sweep inside the wind turbine this rotation rotates the generator. So the rotation of this wind pane will be about 18 rpm, 18 revolutions per minute, which is very small. This should be increased, which is done with the help of the gear arrangement. The gear arrangement in turn is connected to the generator and the generator rotates at a speed of 1800 rpm. This generates electricity. The geothermal energy is a renewable energy which generates electricity from underground heat from earth. The heat energy is taken out through pipes and is fed to the water. The water boils and produces steam. The steam runs the steam turbine which is connected to the generator. The generator in turn rotates and generates electricity. The next promising form of renewable energy is solar energy. The solar energy conversion system generates electricity by extracting the solar power by solar cells. The solar cell is made up of semiconductor material that generates electricity by emission of electron hole pairs due to the incident light. The generated power is DC in nature and is stored in batteries for further use. The power generated in the generating stations travel to the destination through the transmission and distribution lines. The world is powered by the interconnected grid systems with modern technology and supervisory control. Let us have a look over these different stages of the travel of power. Transmission and Distribution line diagram. A single line diagram or a one line diagram is a simplified notation for representing all electrical components in a three phase power system. In this single line diagram, the power generated by alternator or generator will be fed to the step up transformer where the voltage is increased. The output of transformer is transmitted for a long distance to the receiving station where the voltage is reduced. The output from this is fed to the substation where the voltage is reduced and also fed to the industrial consumers requiring high voltage. Further, voltage is reduced by step down transformer and fed to the domestic consumers or small industries. Transformer. A transformer is a static device which transfers electrical energy from one circuit to another through the process of electromagnetic induction. 
it is commonly used to increase or decrease the voltage levels between the circuits. A transformer that increases voltage between the primary to secondary windings is defined as step-up transformer. A transformer that decreases voltage between the primary to secondary windings is defined as a step-down transformer. A transformer has three main parts, two windings and metallic core on which the windings are wound. Windings are in the form of coil made of good conductor of current. When an alternating current is allowed to flow in any of the winding, there will be an alternating flux produced surrounding the winding. The magnitude of this flux is proportional to the magnitude of the current flowing in the winding. Alternating current produces alternating flux, which in turn produces induced EMF across the winding. So we can say that the supply voltage causes an induced EMF which is an effect of this cause. Hence, according to the Lenz law, this induced EMF will be in the opposite polarity of the supply voltage. Effect opposes cause. Suppose one separate winding is brought nearer to the first winding then this second winding gets linked with a portion of varying flux with the first winding. Due to this varying flux linkage, there will also be an induced EMF across it. This induced EMF would be quite small as because the flux linkage is small. Hence, the rate of change of flux linkage is also small. According to Faraday's law, EMF is directly proportional to rate of change of flux linkage. And if the secondary winding is connected with the load, the small amount of current flows through the load. Some portion of the input power is transformed to the output through the second winding. This is because some portion of generative flux of first winding is linked with second. Now if you want to transform maximum electric power from first winding to second winding, we have to link maximum flux of first winding to second winding. This is done by placing a low reluctance magnetic core in between these windings. Steel is a well-known low reluctance magnetic material. So we normally use steel to make low reluctance magnetic core in the transformer. When the steel core is placed in between the windings, they leave the entire flux around the first winding concentrated inside the core and link with the second winding. As nearly the same flux links with the second winding, the rate of change of flux with respect to time is equal in both the windings. Since as per Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, induced EMF across the conductor is directly proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. The voltage induced per turn will be the same. We have already explained that voltage induced in the first winding is same as in the supply voltage. As this first winding is connected to supply, this is known as primary winding. So there is a n1 number of turns in primary side with supply voltage V1. So the voltage per turn that is V1 by n1 for the primary will be equal to each number of turns in the secondary. So the total number of turns in the secondary is n2. So the total voltage induced in the secondary is N2 into V1 by N1. In the second winding, the voltage V2 is induced. And due to the voltage, there will be current flowing in the second circuit. Normally, in the transformer, the second winding is connected to the load circuit. 
This winding is referred to as secondary winding. If the number of turns of secondary winding is not equal to that of primary winding, suppose if N2 is greater than N1, the secondary voltage is more than primary voltage. On the other hand, if N2 is less than N1, the secondary voltage will be less than primary voltage. Former is called step up transformer and the lateral is called step down transformer. This is the most basic theory of transformer. The power generated by the generator will be fed to the input of the step-up transformer which increases the voltage level. The voltage is increased because the generation of electricity is usually in a rural area. So obviously power has to be transmitted to a very long distance to reach the consumers. The heat losses occurs in the conductor which is equal to I square R and the resistance of the conductor is fixed. So obviously the current needs to be reduced to reduce the heat losses. So we know that P is equal to Vi cos pi. Cos pi almost fits for a system. Power is fixed depending on generation. So either we need to increase the voltage and decrease the current or increase the current and decrease the voltage to maintain the product constant such that we can maintain the power. The voltage is increased to reduce the current as we can reduce the heat losses. So this is the reason why we step up the voltage near the generation. Transmission. Step up voltage from the generation is fed to the distribution center through transmission lines. Classification is made based on the distance of the transmission lines and voltage level. So basically there are two types of transmission that is primary transmission and secondary transmission. So in primary transmission, transmission of the power is from generating station to receiving station and in secondary transmission, the transmission of power is from receiving station to the substation which is located near load centers. Distribution. The classification of distribution are primary distribution and secondary distribution. Primary distribution, it delivers power from distribution substations to distribution transformer. The voltage level of primary distribution is higher compared to secondary distribution. It directly fed to the industries requiring high voltage or heavy loads. Secondary distribution, it delivers power from primary distribution to domestic consumers or industry. The voltage level will be usually 230 volts or 440 volts. SCADA SCADA is an acronym for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. A computer system for gathering and analyzing real-time data. SCADA systems are used to monitor and control a plant or equipment in industries such as telecommunication, water and waste control, energy, oil and gas refining and transportation and power system parameters. SCADA in power system. The role of SCADA in power system are it monitors the fault, it controls the electrical parameters like frequency in India is to be maintained at 50 Hertz. So all the equipments are designed at 50 Hertz. So the frequency needs to be maintained constant and SCADA will continuously monitor and control to maintain it. SCADA is reliable. It increases efficiency. It reduces labor as all the system is completely automated. SCADA can isolate any part of the power system when fault occurs 
to avoid the damage of any equipment. Control system plays a major role here. Components. There are three major components of SCADA. Master unit, conversion unit and sensors. The type of sensors used are based on the applications. For measuring temperature, temperature sensors are used. Similarly, we have light intensity, humidity, pressure, tank level, etc. are sensed for automation by using respective sensors. Next is conversion unit. So conversion unit has PLC or RTUs. That is PLC is programmable logic controller and RTU is remote terminal unit which is controlled by microprocessor. It is interfaced with SCADA. Next is master unit. Master unit has SCADA which is a supervisory computer system. It also has human machine interface. The data from the sensor is sent to the PLC or RTU which in turn sends the data to SCADA through LAN network. SCADA acquires the data and sends the command to PLC or RTU to control the necessary device or equipment. Having learnt about SCADA in the previous session, we would have told the importance of control systems. So control system is used for controlling the power in power system. Similarly, control system plays major role in many applications. Before going into control system, let me understand what are all the components present in control system. The first one is we have to understand what is a system. A system is a combination of number of equipments or components connected in a sequence to perform a specific function. What is control system? In a system, when the output quantity is controlled automatically and maintained at desired value, then the system is called as control system, which means that we are going to control the output quantity and we are going to maintain at the desired value. There are many types of control system. The first one is open loop system. Open loop system is the one in which the system is not capable of correcting the changes by itself. Then it is called as open loop system. Let me have a look over, over the di block diagram of open loop system. An open loop system consists of a controller and a process. The input is fed to the controller and the output is taken out from the process. Whatever is the input fed to the controller, accordingly the output will be produced. When there is a disturbance in the system, then the output will be changing, which means that the output is not constant. The output is, ma is not maintained at the desired value. Such a system is called as open loop system. The applications of open loop system are automatic washing machine, electric bulb, electric hand dryer, time based bread toaster, volume of the audio system, TV remote control, cloth dryer, etc. In automatic washing machine, the time is preset where we will be setting the time in the washing machine and the machine will be running for the preset time. It does not measure the cleanliness of the cloth and hence this is called as an open loop system. The another example of an open loop system is the bread toaster. You can see here this is the bread toaster and what we will be doing here is we will be setting out the time for toasting the bread. The input is the time level and bread is put in the bread toaster. According to the time set, the bread will be toasted. It does not measure whether the bread is toasted or not. And again, it does not, it will be overcooked or it is not toasted. Hence, such a system is called as an open loop system. The next comes the closed loop system. Closed loop system is the system in which the output has an effect upon the input quantity in such a manner that to maintain the desired output constant, such a system is called as closed loop system. The open loop system can be modified as closed loop system by providing a feedback. You can see the block diagram of a closed loop system. Here we can see the controller and plant which is already present in open loop system. Along with it, 
you will have a feedback. Feedback is taken from the plant output and is fed to the input. You will have an error detector which is going to compare the input point and the feedback which is taken out from the output. According to the difference between the two signals, an error will be produced. That error will be producing an error signal to the controller and controller output depends upon the error signal. The controller output will be controlling the plant and hence the plant output is controlled. Whenever there is a disturbance, the plant output will change. Accordingly, the feedback value will also change. The error value will be changing. The controller will control the plant accordingly such that the plant output is maintained constant. Such an example of closed loop system are a human traveling on the road, automatic electric iron, voltage stabilizer, water, le water level controller, air conditioner, speed regulator, missile launcher, turbine water control system at power station. Why a human traveling on the road is called as a closed loop system? Because when a human is traveling on the road and where there is a disturbance, the disturbance may be in the form of a stone or anything like that. The human will take a different path and he will be safe. Such a system is called as closed loop system. The brain senses, the eye senses and sends signal to the brain saying that there is a disturbance in the system. Accordingly, control action will be taken and the human takes a different route. If the human is going to close his eyes and walk, he do not understand there is a disturbance in the system. He will be hit and will be and he will not take up his path. Such a system is called as open loop system. Another example of a closed loop system is, you can see here, this is a water level controller. The water level in the tank is controlled by means of a closed loop system. We have got a level transducer which maintains the water level and an automatic control is present which will be opening and closing the valve accordingly to, accordingly to maintain the water level. So here, when the water level goes down, the automatic controller will control the valve and it will open the inlet such that the level is maintained at the same level. This is an example of closed loop system. In this video, we are going to see examples of open loop system and closed loop system. Please look into the video. There are different types of control systems used in robotics. In open loop control, the computer sends signals based on the current state without taking into account feedback from the system. This type of system is also called non-servo or pick and place and is used in about 35% of the robots in the United States. In open loop control systems, signals are first sent by a computer controller to the system driver. The system driver then converts those signals into an operation for the process or robot to perform. The system driver can be anything from a pneumatic actuator, a hydraulic flow valve, or an electrical controller. In open loop systems, the program length of time the signal is applied as well as the integrity of the signal are critical for ensuring that the new operation is completed. This is because there is no feedback to the computer from the system driver or the robot and thus no updates to the signal outputs can be made. The term process in this illustration simply means any piece of equipment that accomplishes work. This could be a robotic arm, a motor, or an engine. For the purposes of this module, we'll focus on robots. Once the signal is received, the robot performs the appropriate action. In an open loop system, the signals that go from the computer to the system driver to the robot are never checked with a feedback loop to ensure that the robot has completed its task. A simple example of an open loop system is an industrial sprinkler system. In this example, the programmer updates the computer controller, which will turn the sprinkler on at a designated time. When the computer sends the signal, the water valve will turn on. 
When the valve turns on, water flows to the sprinkler and drives a motor that allows the sprinkler to simultaneously move along the field and water the crop. Some good examples for open loop control systems are stop and go conveyor systems with constant loading and manufacturing applications with high repeatability and low variation such as punching holes out of a piece of sheet metal or reorienting work pieces. Material handling and machine tending operations also account for many open loop design applications. Due to their lack of speed control and lack of flexible work positions, open loop control is useful for well-defined systems where the relationship between input and the resultant state can be modeled. The positions of the robot can be predetermined and the loading environment does not change. Open loop control systems are typically low cost due to their simplistic design, high repeatability, and controller simplicity. Positions of the robot can be predetermined and the loading environment does not change. Open loop control systems are typically low cost due to their simplistic design, high repeatability, and controller simplicity. They should be used where motion is predefined, repeatable, and does not vary. The second type of control system is called closed loop control or servo control. A servo is a device that uses error sensing feedback to control the motion of another device. The primary difference in an open versus closed loop system is the addition of a feedback loop that allows the controller to make adjustments to the robot. In our previous example of a sprinkler, the system was open loop because the controller received no feedback. But if a moisture sensor is added, it becomes a closed loop system. The sensor measures the moisture density of the soil and sends that information back to the computer controller. The computer can then make adjustments to the quantity of water coming from the sprinkler. The advantages of closed loop control systems include flexible program control, ease of changing programmed points, the capacity for complex manufacturing tasks, and multiple program storage and execution capabilities. These flexible capabilities allow the same machine to utilize multiple programs with different operations based on the work being presented, all without a change in machinery. Closed loop systems require a larger upfront capital investment and highly skilled maintainers, but the payback comes from a much larger range of capabilities. Closed loop controllers are used in machining, welding, coating and sealer application, material handling, machine tending, arc and water jet cutting, inspection, and assembly operations. During heavy acceleration from a standstill or when lurching with traffic, wheels can lose traction, reducing the driver's control of the vehicle. Traction control prevents this wheel slip. So, how does it work? The traction control module monitors data from the wheel speed sensors and the powertrain control module. It samples this data continually, comparing the rotational speed of each wheel. If one or more wheels is rotating faster than the others, indicating traction loss, the system takes action. It instructs the powertrain control module to reduce torque and the braking system to apply braking pressure to the slipping wheel until it regains traction. Traction control allows drivers to safely apply heavy acceleration when merging with fast moving traffic and on slippery or loose surfaces.
we are going to discuss the classification of batteries secondary storage cells and its working key points in process flow secondary storage cells practical applications identified are best understood by animation video and the secret behind the invention of tesla car uh, behind the animation video a message on enlightenment now the first topic classification of batteries batteries are general classified as primary and secondary batteries batteries are group of cells so we so we say interchangeably as secondary and primary cells before knowing secondary batteries what are primary batteries they are non rechargeable batteries used in our applications such as wall clock and brisk watch and playable toys but our motto would be to use secondary batteries because they are rechargeable for n number of cycles what is meant by cycle cycle stage are includes charge and discharge of a secondary battery and utilization of it let us consider a scenario if we speak through mobile phone our battery gets drained or simply discharge if we charge for 100% then it's considered as one cycle now you can understand what is a cycle researchers for the past two decades considerably increases this cycle are more utilization of secondary batteries as i said in the end of 20th century a secondary cell or battery can be used for 100 cycles that is you can make 100 times charge the battery to utilize it for applications now we will see the working of voltaic cells and its process of conversion of chemical energy into electrical energy the yeah, voltaic cells also called galvanic cells so galvanic cells are voltaic cells are devices uses chemical reaction to create electricity specifically the type of chemical reaction used here is oxidation reduction reaction it seems to you a totally new device for you but to use almost every single day in your life yeah it's a battery a yeah, battery is an example of a galvanic or voltaic cells there are chemicals inside battery those chemicals react together in oxidation and reduction reaction and it makes electricity it gives power to cell phones flashlights wherever they are inducted let's learn more about these devices on how chemical reaction creates electricity the diagram labeled as 4 represents the electrical setup of voltaic cell or galvanic cell we have to know what causing electrons to move along the wire to create electricity or simply electrifying the bulb let me show you a magnified setup of voltaic cell in the diagram labeled as 5 it represents atomic or stable state of zinc and molecular state inside zinc sulfate solution on the other side it represents atomic or stable state of copper and molecular state inside copper sulfate solution a shown in diagram labeled as 6 it creates the tug of war as a result copper 2 plus has a strong pull for electrons results in ordering a pull of electrons from zinc side hence creates movement of electrons from zinc to copper side creates electricity as we all know that oxidation reaction happens on zinc means losing electrons and on other side reduction reaction happens on copper that means gaining electrons hence by oxidation and reduction basic flow of electricity happens in rechargeable batteries let's see what are the key points discussed in process flow first one is flow of electrons happens as a result strong pull of electrons from zinc to copper this was named as oxidation and reduction reaction so oxidation means loss of electrons happens at zinc and reduction means gain of electrons happens at copper conclusively flow of electrons are termed as electricity now we are uh, going to discuss secondary batteries practical applications it means 
secondary batteries are employed in mobile phones for various applications such as communication with people or friends watching movies playing multimedia games live streaming videos leads to battery discharge let me see it with the help of animation video you probably know the feeling your phone utters its final plaintive bleep and cuts out in the middle of your call in that moment, you may feel more like throwing your battery across the room than singing its praises. But batteries are a triumph of science. They allow smartphones and other technologies to exist without anchoring us to an infernal tangle of power cables. Yet even the best batteries will diminish daily, slowly losing capacity until they finally die. So why does this happen? And how do our batteries even store so much charge in the first place? It all started in the 1780s with two Italian scientists, Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta, and a frog. Legend has it that as Galvani was studying a frog's leg, he brushed a metal instrument up against one of its nerves, making the leg muscles jerk. Galvani called this animal electricity believing that a type of electricity was stored in the very stuff of life. But Volta disagreed, arguing that it was the metal itself that made the leg twitch. The debate was eventually settled with Volta's groundbreaking experiment. He tested his idea with a stack of alternating layers of zinc and copper separated by paper or cloth soaked in a saltwater solution. What happened in Volta's cell is something chemists now call oxidation and reduction. The zinc oxidizes, which means it loses electrons, which are in turn gained by the ions in the water in a process called reduction, producing hydrogen gas. Volta would have been shocked to learn that last bit. He thought the reaction was happening in the copper rather than the solution. Nonetheless, we honor Volta's discovery today by naming our standard unit of electric potential the volt. This oxidation reduction cycle creates a flow of electrons between two substances. And if you hook a light bulb or vacuum cleaner up between the two, you'll give it power. Since the 1700s, scientists have improved on Volta's design. They've replaced the chemical solution with dry cells filled with chemical paste. But the principle is the same. A metal oxidizes, sending electrons to do some work before they are regained by a substance being reduced. But any battery has a finite supply of metal, and once most of it has oxidized, the battery dies. So rechargeable batteries give us a temporary solution to this problem by making the oxidation reduction process reversible. Electrons can flow back in the opposite direction with the application of electricity. Plugging in a charger draws the electricity from a wall outlet that drives the reaction to regenerate the metal making more electrons available for oxidation the next time you need them. But even rechargeable batteries don't last forever. Over time, the repetition of this process causes imperfections and irregularities in the metal's surface that prevent it from oxidizing properly. The electrons are no longer available to flow through a circuit, and the battery dies. Some everyday rechargeable batteries will die after only hundreds of discharge-recharge cycles, while newer, advanced batteries can survive and function for thousands. Batteries of the future may be light-thin sheets that operate on the principles of quantum physics and last for hundreds of thousands of charge cycles. But until scientists find a way to take advantage of motion to recharge your cell battery, like cars do, or fit solar panels somewhere on your device, plugging your charger into the wall rather than expending one battery to charge another is your best bet to for Yeah, what are the key points we addressed in these applications? Scientists Voltaic and Galvanic together lead to battery invention, said as Voltaic or Galvanic cells. And remember that invention by representing voltage in terms of volt. As I said already, oxidation and reduction happens for 100 cycles. And the researchers had lead to make 100,000 of cycles with the help of quantum physics. Now, a wonder happens behind the invention of Tesla cars. So far, we had discussed the application of batteries in mobile phones, but researchers need to make battery 
to act as a fuel to run the car. That batteries last up to 25,000 cycles are simply 25 years without replacement. We can run the automobiles. So that was the secret behind the invention of Tesla car in the 21st century. Now, we will see the role of lithium ion batteries in Tesla car. Induction motors are far superior to IC engines in almost all engineering aspects, as well as being more robust and cheaper. Another huge disadvantage of IC engines is that they only produce usable torque in a narrow band of engine RPM. Considering all of these factors, induction motors are definitely the perfect choice for an automobile. However, the power supply for an induction motor is the real bottleneck in achieving a major induction motor revolution in the automobile industry. Let's explore how Tesla, with the help of lithium ion cells, solved this issue and why lithium ion cells are going to become even better in the future. Let's take a Tesla cell out from the battery pack and break it down. You can see different layers of chemical compounds inside it. Tesla's lithium ion battery works on an interesting concept associated with metals called the electrochemical potential. Electrochemical potential is the tendency of a metal to lose electrons. In fact, the very first cell developed by Alessandro Volta more than 200 years ago was based on the concept of electrochemical potential. A general electrochemical series is shown here. According to these values, lithium has the highest tendency to lose electrons and fluorine has the least tendency to lose electrons. Volta took two metals with different electrochemical potentials, in this case zinc and silver, and created an external flow of electricity. Sony made the first commercial model of a lithium ion battery in 1991. It was again based on the same concept of electrochemical potential. Lithium, which has the highest tendency to lose electrons, was used in lithium ion cells. Lithium has only one electron in its outer shell and always wants to lose this electron. Due to this reason, pure lithium is a highly reactive metal. It even reacts with water and air. The trick of a lithium ion battery operation is the fact that lithium, in its pure form, is a reactive metal. But when lithium is part of a metal oxide, it is quite stable. Assume that somehow, we have separated a lithium atom from this metal oxide. This lithium atom is highly unstable and will instantly form a lithium ion and an electron. However, lithium as a part of metal oxide is much more stable than this state. If you can provide two different paths for the electron and lithium ion flow between the lithium and the metal oxide, the lithium atom will automatically reach the metal oxide part. During this process, we have produced electricity from the electron flow through the one path. From these discussions, it is clear that we can produce electricity from this lithium metal oxide if we firstly separate out lithium atoms from the lithium metal oxide and secondly guide the electrons lost from such lithium atoms through an external circuit. Let's see how lithium ion cells achieve these two objectives. A practical lithium ion cell also uses an electrolyte and graphite. Graphite has a layered structure. These layers are loosely bonded so that the separated lithium ions can be stored very easily there. The electrolyte between the graphite and the metal oxide acts as a guard which allows only lithium ions through. Now let's see what happens when you connect a power source across this arrangement. The positive side of the power source will obviously attract and remove electrons from the lithium atoms of the metal oxide. These electrons flow through the external circuit as they cannot flow through the electrolyte and reach the graphite layer. In the meantime, the positively charged lithium ions will be attracted towards the negative terminal and will flow through the electrolyte. Lithium ions also reach the graphite layer space and get trapped there. Once all the lithium atoms reach the graphite sheet, the cell is fully charged. Thus, we have achieved the first objective which is the lithium ions and electrons detached from the metal oxide. As we discussed, this is an unstable state, as if being perched on top of a hill. As soon as the power source is removed and a load is connected,
The lithium ions want to go back to their stable state as a part of the metal oxide. Due to this tendency, the lithium ions move through the electrolyte and electrons via the load, just like sliding down a hill. Thus, we get an electrical current through the load. Please note that the graphite does not have a role in the chemical reaction of the lithium ion cells. Graphite is just a storage medium for lithium ions. If the internal temperature of the cell rises due to some abnormal condition, the liquid electrolyte will dry up and there will be a short circuit between the anode and cathode, and this can lead to a fire or an explosion. To avoid such a situation, an insulating layer, called a separator, is placed between the electrodes. The separator is permeable for the lithium ions because of its microporosity. In a practical cell, the graphite and metal oxide are coated onto copper and aluminum foils. The foils act as current collectors here, and the positive and negative tabs can be easily taken out from the current collectors. An organic salt of lithium acts as the electrolyte and it is coated onto the separator sheet. All these three sheets are wound onto the cylinder around a central steel core, thus making the cell more compact. A standard Tesla cell has a voltage of between 3 and 4.2 volts. So from this video, you could understand the role of induction motor in Tesla car. The induction motor replaces conventional IC engine in automobiles. An induction motor not only used to for that purpose in our day-to-day -day applications. Our fan, the technical name is single phase capacitor start induction motor. And the second one is, in the year 1990 itself, the NIMH battery used in mobile phones are replaced by lithium ion batteries. As a result, enhanced battery life uh, comes for mobile phones. Thank you for your patient listening.